I, I purposely asked Cy to, uh, to, to be at this session because uh, he is going to cover some stuff that is really the crux of, of, of what all we're talking about. I'm, I'm sorry for the people that are gone already that, that aren't uh, going to be able to hear this because this is going to be incredibly, incredibly important for you guys to hear this. Um, his consistency in apologetics has been an incredible teaching to me. About four years ago, an atheist twittered about something and said, hey, you need to go make fun of this website. And the website was www.proofthatgodexists.org. And I thought, well, I want to go make fun of something too. Let me go see what this is all about. And so I go to this website, proofthatgodexists.org, and I was literally blown away at the, uh, at the use of this, you know, just logical website of forcing people to realize, wow, I do believe in God. The, the trick is, and I don't know how much you're going to cover about it, but and he's not really going to go into his website. You need to go check that out, get his business card, get one of his tracks. But the trick is, in order to get to his website, you have to admit that God exists. So the atheists hate it. They're like, oh, I don't want to admit this. Stop it. Yeah, oh, they can't stand it. But it's, it's, it's absolutely fabulous. And uh, Cy has really been teaching me a lot over the past four years. We Skype, uh, you know, two to three times a week and talk through things, and he's really been mentoring me in a lot of this uh, stuff that I've been learning. And so I am, I am incredibly excited to introduce to you guys Cy tenbergen who I feel uh, is really, in, in a large part, uh, very, very large part, responsible for this conference and helping bring this to you guys uh, because of what he's taught to me. You guys are going to absolutely love what he does. Now, uh, he's probably not going to advertise, so I just want to tell you, he has put together a thumb drive that is at his booth. This one thumb drive right here was the easiest way for him to get this done. That you can get, I think he's selling it for 20 bucks. It has over 40 hours of teaching on this thing right here. I don't know how they fit all that in there, but over 40 hours of teaching between conversations with atheists, debates that he and I have done together, conversations that he's had, you are going to thoroughly thoroughly enjoy putting this in and listening to this. You're really, really going to enjoy this. But I don't want to take up any more of his time. I just had to put a plug in in case he wouldn't do it. Um, uh, would you guys please help me in welcoming Mr. Cy Ten Bergenkate. Weepy. Story of my life. Cracking. Check. Check one. That's okay. I wasn't nervous enough to start. So. <laughs> All right. What did I do here? All right. Here we go. At the Proof of God conference. What speaker am I? I'm like the sixth of the eight or something like that. And I really appreciate y'all coming back here after dinner. Hopefully I don't put you to sleep. But after six speakers, can you now defend the God of the Bible? Can you defend the God of the Bible? How many of you were in my breakout session? <laughs> See, that's why. You can't defend the God of the Bible. Are you kidding me? The God of the Bible needs no defense. You know, the thing is, in my breakout session, I was exposing a lot of apologists for doing it wrong. We got it wrong. Can you defend the God of the Bible? You can't defend the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible needs no defense. And... See, Eric and I, we have a love-hate relationship. I love him, he hates me. <laughs> for bringing this stuff up. But you see, I heart accuracy. And where's Christine? She got me a shirt with that on it for my birthday, so I appreciate that. Thanks, Christine. I just thought it was cool. I heart accuracy. So, I actually tweaked the graphic a little bit. You can defend your faith in the God of the Bible. That's what we're commanded to do. We cannot 
defend the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible needs no defense. So just keep that in mind. But with that in mind, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for allowing this conference to take place this evening. How majestic is your name in all the earth, Lord God. Please help me to speak only truth this evening, Lord God, and if there's anything that comes out of my mouth that is not honoring to thee, Lord God, that you bind my mouth and close the ears of those who might hear, Lord God, but if what I'm speaking this evening is truth, please open their ears, open their hearts, prick their hearts, Lord God, that they can go forth here and proclaim your name, that in all they say and do and think and are, Lord God, they might be glorifying you. pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. My name is indeed Cy Tembrinke. I'm an apologist. I'm somebody who defends the truth of Christianity. That's what apologetics is. And uh, those of you who are in my breakout session know that four years ago, four and a half years ago, I was working in a boiler room in a factory. So you have a boiler operator teaching you how to defend the faith. But I want to encourage you with that because that means that I am you guys. I'm not dynamic speaker dude. <laughs> I'm you guys. So if you have trouble de uh, defending your faith and, you know, if you come out this evening and um, you think, well, I... This is all new to me. Five, six years ago, well, four years ago, I was working in a factory, but five, six years ago, I didn't even know how to defend my faith this way. I was not honoring God with my apologetic. So uh, I'm from, um, originally from Toronto, Ontario. And I moved to a town called Dorchester. That's about two hours east of Detroit, straight east. I know a lot of you actually live further north than me in the States. My, my uh, nephew used to go to school in northern Michigan. Michigan. They said, so you're going north for the holidays? He says, actually, I'm going south. They don't realize that a lot of Canada is south of the United States. You have to look at a map. Apologetics is a reasoned defense of the truth of Christianity. That's a big word, apologetics. When I teach this, because it seems so complicated, such a big word, I've had people say to me, you know, I really can't do apologetics. I just can't do it. And you know what I say to them? I really can't love people. I wish I could love people, but those people, they're really good at loving people. You know, well, let them love people. One woman I said that to, she looked kind of incensed. Another one just smiled and nodded. It's not whether you can do it or not. We're commanded to do it. We're commanded to love people. So that's why we do apologetics, because God tells us to. And we have to be equipped to do it. Now, one thing that you'll find um, with this apologetic, hopefully, is that it drives you back to Scripture. It drives you back to our ultimate authority. You know... I was at a conference recently, and a fellow came up to me, and he said, Sai, I hear you're an apologist. I'd really like to learn how to defend the faith from you. All I do is answer with Scripture. I said to him, you are a better apologist than I am. And you know, when I was first explaining this to Eric about three years ago, he said one of the nicest things that anybody's ever said to me after I explained this apologetic to him. He said, I thought I had to take courses in microbiology and astrophysics. He said, I have to read my Bible more. I just came back from a week Ivy League tour through the university with eight schools in seven days. And you know what I thought at the end of the week? I need to read my Bible more. That's what this apologetic does. It drives you back to Scripture. Now, people, some people are embarrassed to read from Scripture because they think people will mock them because of what the Bible says. But you know something? I've seen it. I've seen people answer with the Bible, and it closes mouths. It closes mouths. Because you know what? The Bible does not say, my sheep here size really good argument. The Bible does not say, my sheep here size presuppositionalism. You know what the Bible says? What Jesus said? My sheep hear my voice. We have to go to Scripture, answer with Scripture, answer with the words of Christ. Proving the God of the Bible. That's my website, proofthatgodexists.org, so it's an appropriate topic that I get proving the God of the Bible. Eric said I wasn't going to talk about my website, and he was wrong. <laughs> That's the front page of my website, and I ask people if absolute truth exists. Absolute truth exists, absolute truth does not exist. I don't know if absolute truth exists, and I don't care if absolute truth exists. What's the first thing that the unbeliever clicks on? I don't know if absolute truth, or no, he says absolute truth does not exist. You know, I don't know what, I don't have site statistics, I don't know what they click on first, but if you click on absolute truth does not exist, it goes to this page. Absolute truth does not exist. 
absolutely true or false. <laughs> to say absolute truth does not exist is to make an absolute truth claim. So not, no matter which button you click, it takes you back to the first page. <laughs> well, it used to take you back to the first page until I get email after email after email. There's something wrong with your website. <laughs> I said, no, there's nothing wrong with my website, so I changed the first page. Now it says, this is not a glitch. Think about it. <laughs> Does absolute truth exist? And they say, well, I guess I really don't know if absolute truth exists. So they click on, I don't know if absolute truth exists. I don't know if absolute truth exists. Absolutely true or false? Is it true that you don't know that? To deny absolute truth absolutely is absurd. It's insane. So, then they go back and they say, well, I guess I really don't care if absolute truth exists. So they click on that, and it takes them to Disney. <laughs> if you don't care if absolute truth exists, you might as well have some fun. Because this is the best it's going to get for you. Now, I have Christians emailing me saying, you know, that's really not nice that you're doing that to these <laughs> And I say, you know, if Disney was around at the time of the Apostle Paul, he might have said, if what we believe is not true, you might as well eat and drink and go to Disney for tomorrow we die. It's a biblical argument. Of course, it's the atheists that actually get a chuckle and they go back to this site. So then, actually, that's just to get into the website. They click Absolute Truth Exists, and that's just the entrance, but you could check that out at your leisure. Now, what I teach you today, what I'm going to teach you, is going to enable you to win arguments. You're going to be able to win arguments with unbelievers. But if that's the goal, you're here for the wrong, wrong reason. It's a consequence that speaking biblical truth, you're going to be able to win arguments. Now, I, I know of a speaker. He was speaking the same type of apologetics I was. And then the name of his topic was called How to Argue with an Atheist and Win. And a woman came up to him afterwards and he says, You know, sir, I don't think God is very happy when you go around winning arguments. And he said, ma'am, I think God's a whole lot less pleased when you go around losing them. <laughs> so, when you represent the God of Christianity, you will win arguments, but that should not be our goal. So, if you're in this, like I said, to win arguments, you're in for the wrong reason. The first time I ever taught this was to a group of teens. And after that, one of the parents came up to me. He says, my son is so excited. He can't wait to get back to get to school tomorrow. He's so excited about what he learned. And I thought, oh, amen, fantastic. I taught this kid. I've given him a good tool that he can use at school. And then it wasn't until a few months later that I thought, what if I was teaching karate? And the father came up to me and says, my son can't wait, back, wait to get back to school. And I'm thinking, I might have done something wrong there. <laughs> Now, you know, maybe he was genuine, but if he wants to go there and beat people up, you know, I've done it wrong. And if you've been beaten up with bad apologetics your entire life, and, you know, you finally find a biblical apologetic with which you can win arguments, you might want to be a jerk about it. But you have to keep in mind that what we have, we've been given. You can't be a jerk about it. That's why I'm very reluctant to teach jerks. I'd rather have people who are that way do it wrong. And I still taught Eric. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> no, uh, we've been going through this together. That's the beauty of it, because we're not at the PhD level, so we get these arguments and we go over Skype and we give each other a lot of feedback. We actually share our PowerPoint presentations, and you're going to see that tonight. Because I was up there when Eric was doing his talk, I thought, got to take that off, got to take that off. And I didn't take any of it out, because I thought, repetition is good for everybody. Because I thought, repetition is good for everybody. <laughs> All right. Now, what did Jesus say? For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. What is gainsay? To declare false or to deny, to oppose, especially by contradiction. Jesus said, I will give you words that your adversaries will not be able to resist or contradict. I mean, that's powerful stuff. I'll tell you something. That is not the complexity of the I. When you're doing this apologetic, you're destroying worldviews. Now, some people say, I don't have to learn apologetics. It says in um, 
Luke 12, verse 11 and 12, Take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall say, or what, how ye shall answer, or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. You say, great, you know, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will give me the words, so I don't have to study it. I don't have to study it, the Holy Spirit will give me words. And then I show them this verse. Take ye no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or drink, or what, shall, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. I don't see those people walking out naked. You know, we don't have to worry about what we're going to wear. We don't have to worry about what we're going to say. It does not mean that we don't be prepared. So what does it say in 1 Peter 3.15? This is the Magna Carta of the apologetic verses. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear. Now, why does Peter give a warning to do this with meekness and fear? Because you're not talking about the complexity of the eye. Look at the complexity of the eye. There must be a God, you jerk. <laughs> no. We have to do it with meekness and fear, as I said, because we're destroying worldviews. See, if you go to a store and buy a Nerf ball, there's not a lot of warnings with that. If you buy a gun, you'll have a list of warnings. When Peter tells us to defend our faith, he does it with a warning. Because what we're doing, like I say, destroys worldviews. Now these are a couple of verses. I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just go through them quickly, go through the highlighted areas, but other verses that tell you to do apologetics. This is from Jude 1.3, we have to contend for the faith. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we cast down imaginations. Now people say, you know, like I just like to bake somebody a casserole. You know, that's how I defend my faith. I just go over there, I be friendly, I do their dishes, I cut their grass. How do you cast down imaginations by baking a casserole? You have to be prepared to defend your faith. So what are my qualifications for teaching you today? Most of my life I was doing it wrong. Most of my life I was doing it wrong. And as I said in the breakout, if you want somebody to teach you how to defend the faith properly, you want someone that used to do it wrong. If you want somebody to teach you how to get off drugs, you want somebody that used to be on drugs. If you want somebody to teach you how to get off smoking, you want somebody that used to smoke. Well, I used to, I used to teach apologetics. I used to do it wrong. Why am I here teaching you? Because most Christians are doing it wrong too. Now hopefully, if you walk away from here and you understand a proper biblical apologetic, you don't go bash other Christians for doing it wrong. Because one of my favorite biblical verses is 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do we have that we've not been given? So if you walk away with a proper understanding of apologetics, it's not because of anything I've said. It's not because of your intellect. It's because God gave it to you. Keep that in mind. Don't lord it over other people. So what was I doing wrong? When a person told me they didn't believe in God, I gave them evidence. I gave them evidence for the existence of God. Now one thing is very interesting when a person says he doesn't believe in God. I don't believe in God. What's he actually doing there? You know, he's committing blasphemy. The third commandment says, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. But it only doesn't talk about taking his actual name in vain and using it as a curse word. It talks about his decrees, his ordinances, his words. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that everybody knows that God exists. So when he says, I don't know that God exists, he's actually blaspheming God. And that's something you have to address. You don't go into evidence with somebody to just blaspheme God. And the example that I was thinking of is that if somebody came up to you and said, you know, I think your mother's a prostitute, you wouldn't say, well, last night she was playing bridge, so she couldn't have been on the street last night. And the night before that, she was at choir practice, so I'm pretty sure she wasn't walking the street last night, that night. The day before that, I was over for dinner. So I don't think she was walking. The, the person just called your mother a prostitute. Are you kidding me? How dare you? How dare you call my mother a prostitute? You know better. I don't believe that God exists. How dare you? That's blasphemy. We have to address that. The Bible says that you do know that God exists. So we give them evidence. Do me a favor. Next time somebody says to you that they don't know or they don't believe in God, ask them if you could give them enough evidence if you could prove that he existed, would they worship him? Very interesting question, very powerful question. If I could convince you that God exists, would you worship him? Well, Eric and I, we asked that question at the Reason Rally. 
If you could prove to my satisfaction that God does exist, the God of the Bible uh, exists, would I worship him? No. Why not? Because he's kind of a jerk. If I believed that God exists, and I believed that it was the Bible God that existed, I would not worship it because it is a criminal thing. Now, if a better God existed than the one in the Bible, I still wouldn't worship it, but at least it would be worthy of respect. We're talking about the God of the Bible as an absolutely all-powerful sort of uh, deity. Well, I would see that as the same as somebody who has all power leading a country. I don't know whether I agree with that person that just because they have power that I would worship them. I would have to really see it in action to see if I agree with it ethically on my terms. Let me sum it up with this, just because this is something I'm, I'm real curious about when I speak with atheists. And, and again, I really appreciate you guys uh, talking, and I hope we can we can have another discussion. Um, is let me let me ask this question. Both uh, Jim and Alex. Uh, Jim, I'll ask you first, and then Alex, I'll ask okay, you. Go ahead. Uh, Jim, if it could be demonstrated to your satisfaction that the God of the Bible exists, would you worship Him? No. Alex, if it could be proved to your satisfaction that the God of the Bible exists, would you worship Him? The God of the Bible as presented in the Bible? Yes. Absolutely not, because he's a psychopath. After that debate, I asked Eric, what would be the best argument for those two guys? Dinosaur bones, soft tissue, or every building needs a builder? <laughs> two people said they hate God. Even if you gave them enough evidence, they wouldn't worship him. And you know what these guys do? They wouldn't let us back on the show unless we talked evidence with them. It's craziness. And we do just that. These people know that God exists. They want evidence. Even if you gave them evidence, it wouldn't make a difference. Here's uh, Christopher Hitchens. So all your work is still ahead of you, even if you think that these nonsensical fairy tales do have any basis in fact. So I grant the whole thing, and it makes no difference to me. Wouldn't make me a Christian if it was all true. The stranger on the Nor, bus. And it shouldn't make you one either, unless you are a completely credulous person. The Christopher Hitchens. If you could prove the truth of all the miracles of the Bible, it wouldn't make a difference to him. Christopher Hitchens died not too long ago. And you know how many times I saw on Facebook, now he knows that God exists. Christopher Hitchens is no longer an atheist. Guess what? He knew that God exists before he died. He was without excuse for his sin against the God he knows exists. Now he knows. He's always known. It's not about the evidence. About, that's my Canadian there. <laughs> it's not about the evidence. I did a debate with a fellow named Paul Baird. It's actually um, my first debate. It, it's really interesting because this fellow said, the reason he did so poorly is because I'm an experienced debater. I said, Paul, that was my first debate. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because I'm an intellect or anything like that. It's because I'm speaking the truth of Scripture. And you could check out that debate either on my website or on the thumb drive if you decide to get it. <laughs> this is what Paul Baird said in our first debate. Well, I'd like actually, if I may, to go back to the example that Cy gave of the uh, use of evidence in terms of uh, proving the resurrection. It's a conversation I've had um, with uh, another Christian actually last night, and we were sort of discussing um, just what would it take to convince an atheist that the resurrection had happened? And I said to him, well, if we had affidavits from the Roman guards standing at the foot of the cross, that they'd seen the resurrection take place, they'd seen the body taken down, they'd seen the body taken to the grave, they'd stayed by the body, and they'd actually seen the stone being rolled away, and Jesus come out, and they'd stayed with Jesus all through the 40 days, and watched him ascend to heaven. And that was documented, and that was authenticated. Would an atheist accept it? And I said, no. And that, that, that is really the key. Evidence is not the issue. Evidence is not the issue. This man, if he had affidavits from the Roman guards, watched Jesus ascend into heaven, he still wouldn't believe it. And what are we doing? We're giving them evidence. It's folly. So if it's not about the evidence, what is it about? It's about, it's a big word, presuppositions. Because we all get the same evidence. We all get the same evidence, but we examine the evidence according to what we already believe according to what we already believe, the beliefs we take to the evidence, the beliefs we have before the evidence, the beliefs we have pre-evidence.
the presuppositions. That's what it's about. So that's the kind of thing you examine to see whose beliefs can make sense of what you're doing, can make sense of the evidence. And I'll tell you a story about presuppositions. My friend Dustin Seegers, he's a presuppositionist, brilliant guy. He was at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and a philosophy student, a female, came up to him and said, give me evidence for the resurrection. And he said, you can't account for evidence, you fool, repent. Any of you who know Dustin knows that he wouldn't say that. <laughs> Dustin loves the people out there. He loves the people he talks to. Because you know what he says? That's your mother out there, your sister, your brother, your aunt, your uncle. Do you know what he said? He's a presuppositionist. Do you know what he said when she said, give me evidence for the resurrection? He gave her evidence for the resurrection. She wasn't arguing with him. She just wanted some evidence. You know, he wasn't trying to prove the truth of it. She wanted evidence. He said, I'll give you evidence. Roman guards, you know, he's talking about the, their duty that, you know, if somebody stole the body, that you know, they, would, they would be killed. Talking about the, the stone that was rolled away, the, the female witnesses. And he has a photographic memory. He's boom, boom, boom. He's given her all this evidence. And guess what? He convinced her that the resurrection was true. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? He convinced her that the resurrection was true. You know what she said? Yep, you convinced me that the resurrection is true. But guess what? You didn't prove that he's God. You know what my friend said? You're right. I didn't. She was a naturalist, not the type that goes around on the beach without any clothes on. <laughs> but she was a naturalist. She denied the supernatural. You prove something to a natural, she's going to examine it according to what she already believes. I don't know how that body came back to life. You prove that it happened. Someday we're going to have a reason as to why that happened. Like I said in the breakout, in the meantime, phone Ripley's believe it or not. It's not about the evidence, it's about presuppositions. Where do you hear evidence? What do most Christians do? Someone asks for proof of God, they give evidence. And you hear evidence in the court of law. You know, as Eric was saying too, if you give evidence to the unbeliever, you're actually saying that they're the judge. And the unbeliever will argue evidence with you all day long, till you're blue in the face. Why will they argue evidence with you? Because you're telling them that, that he's the judge. In this courtroom scenario, when you're doing that, where is God? He's in the criminal's box. And you're putting the unbeliever in the judge's chair. And you know, you can win that argument. You can prove that God exists because we have wonderful evidence. But the unbeliever is still the judge. Now, I'm not saying that God hasn't used evidence to convert people because he has. I know genuine Christians. That's the way most people defend their faith. I know people that have come to a genuine faith in Christ through evidences. But the problem is, I think there's a lot of people out there walking this earth who say that they're Christians because of the evidence. And folks, if you're a Christian because of the evidence, you're not a Christian. If you're a Christian because of it, now that sounds kind of weird. Because it's true, it will have the most evidence. But if you're a Christian because of the evidence, you are God. You are the judge. And as I said earlier, I said, what happens if you, next day you back out of your driveway, you back over your three-year-old daughter you didn't see playing on her tricycle? Now you got evidence that there's no God. Now guess what? I don't, I'm not so sure I'm a Christian anymore. See, that's the thing. When things happen that we don't understand, we lean not on our own understanding, we trust God. One of my favorite verses in Scripture, Romans 8, 28, and that all things work for the good of those who love him. That's why I could watch my father rot away, lose both his legs from adult diabetes, paralyzed on one side, and I could praise God. My father was a Christian too, he could praise God too. Because I know that God works all things for, the, those, for those who love him. At the funeral home, I could say, man, I'm happy he's gone. The woman looked at me like I had two heads. And she said, well, my mother, she had eight brain tumors. You know, I was happy to see her go too. I said, you know, if my father had 20 brain tumors, if I didn't know he was saved, I'd want him to live in that agony forever and not go to hell. So it was an interesting day at the funeral home. She said, you picked a really nice spot for your father. I said, I don't care. He's gone. Which casket would you like, sir? The cheapest one. And it was ugly. <laughs> it must have been sitting in the basement for years. Cigarette burns on it, this blue felt, and I, I was so happy when I saw that. He's gone. So we say, well, we don't try Jesus. We don't try Jesus. We'd never put Jesus on trial. I mean, who tried Jesus in the scriptures? Pontius Pilate. We wouldn't try Jesus. We wouldn't think of trying Jesus. Oh, wait a minute. Try Jesus. If any of you have that on your car, I'll get you a paint scraper. 
Try Jesus. This guy's got it on his plate. You know, he's going to have to keep that. Try Jesus. Try Jesus. Try Jesus. I hope that those kind of signs, when you go out from here, make you vomit as well. We don't try the Lord of glory, we submit to him. Now, as I said, if somebody says, I'm a Christian because of the evidence, they're not a Christian. Now, Christian, you know, we will have the best evidence, we'll have the most evidence, but we are Christians because God has taken out our, stone, our heart of stone and given us a heart of flesh. And that's why we're Christians. Now, I can tell you a story that happens when people use evidence to defend their faith. I call this story One Cop Town. This might help you put it into perspective, what I'm talking about when you defend the faith. But what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that you're a policeman in a small town. This town is so small, you're the only policeman. You got that picture in your head? You're, on, you're the only policeman. Every Friday night, you get a call from the local pub. Bob the drunk is drunk again. So you go down to the pub, you pick him up, sure enough, he's drunk. You take him and you pour him into your cruiser. You take him to the station to sleep it off overnight. He's in there. You take your cruiser home for the night because it's such a small town. Saturday morning, you go back to the station to uh, let Bob out. He's sobered up. He signs all his paperwork. But on the way to the station, you stop at the dry cleaner. You pick up your dry cleaning, some uniforms. Hang him in the back of your uniform, uh, in your cruiser. You go, you let Bob out, and you, as you do every Saturday, you go upstairs and you do some paperwork. Around noon, you decide to go home for the day. You go outside, and your cruiser is missing. But it's such a small town, you figure, ah, it's probably those Baker boys, <laughs> you know. They're playing a trick on me, they're going to bring it back. You're not too worried about it, so you don't call it in. But you happen to be an avid cyclist. You have a bicycle at the station. So you take off your police outfit, you put on your bike outfit, and you start going home down the highway. That's actually my brother. He uh, did an Ironman last month in Quebec. Two weeks later, he was hit by a pickup truck. Almost lost his leg. Christian, praising God all the way. I mean, it's beautiful. But anyhow, you're going home down the highway, and you hear a siren. You look over, the sh over your shoulder, Somebody pulling you over. And the cruiser looks awful familiar. It's your cruiser. Out steps Bob, wearing your neatly cleaned and pressed uniform that you just had hanging in the back. And he says to you, you were speeding. Now, folks, that is an apologetic situation. And what do most Christians do? They give evidence. There's no way I could have been speeding, officer. Look at my legs. They're too skinny. You know, I know the land speed record for this type of bicycle is 45 miles an hour, and the speed on this road is 55. There's no way I could have been speeding. You know, the gearing ratio on this, book, on this bike, I could never get up to 55. You know, I know a lot about the radar in that vehicle. There's not, it can't even pick up bicycles. There's not enough metal in them. You're arguing evidence with this guy. And you know what? You can win that argument. You can win the argument. And what's he going to say? I'm so sorry. There's no way you could have been speeding. There's no way you could have been speeding. I'm sorry. Have a nice day. Gets back in your cruiser and drives off. You just won the argument. What's the problem? It's not your cruiser. It's not your uniform. It belongs to the government. District chief, chief hears about it. He shows up, and he's not looking like that. And he's not a fireman. That's the only picture I could find, sorry. Where's your cruiser? Where is your cruiser? Well, Bob pulled me over and over in on Saturday, but uh, I won the argument. Where's your cruiser? Ne neglect of duty. This person has stolen your authority, and you're arguing evidence with them. How can you argue evidence? How can you even do that without God? We're going to talk about that more a little bit later on. Who even needs evidence that God exists? Do Christians need evidence? Do you know for certain that God exists, or is it a blind leap? Or is it somebody somewhere between certainty and a blind leap? Does the Christian need evidence that God exists? As Eric said earlier, what if I told you that I had a wonderful, loving relationship with my wife? I'm just not certain she exists. I've had Christians tell me that they're not certain that God exists. I really am not certain that God exists. I, that's what Christians have told me. And I said, I have one word for you. Repent. Repent. Now, this is a question that I ask Christians. 
Is repentance something you say, something you think, something you do? Most Christians get that wrong. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means a change of mind. Repentance is something you think. Repentance is something you think. How do I change my mind about God? How do I repent? Folks, you can't. You can't. Repentance is a gift. Repentance is a gift. If you're not certain about God, you have to get on your face and beg for repentance. What does it say in 2 Timothy 2.25? In meekness instructing those who oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to, the, to acknowledging of the truth. God has to grant repentance so they can see the truth. Now, if you, I'm not saying you know, that you're not Christians if you're not certain, because everybody is certain that God exists. That's what the Bible says. Everybody is certain that God exists. If you're professing something that's not certain, it's because the world has duped you into professing something that's not God. Who needs proof that God exists? Well, not the Christian. What about the atheist, the agnostic, the Jehovah's Witness, the Muslim, the Hindu, the Buddhist, the tribes person in, in Africa? Do they need proof that God exists? How do we determine who needs proof that God exists? How do we figure that out? Think about it. Does that person need proof that God exists? Arm wrestle? I really hope that's Photoshop. <laughs> take a vote. Take a survey. If people are trying to wonder what that tribe is on the bottom there, I made it up, so don't even bother Googling it. Hold a discussion group, canvas the neighborhood, find out what God says about it in his word. How do we know who needs proof that God exists? Well, that's the right answer. That's always going to be the right answer. Find out what God says. And Eric read this verse earlier, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I'm just going to go through that. But... It's clearly seen these people are without excuse. According to those verses, who needs proof that God exists? On that list, who needs proof that God exists? Who believes in God? Everyone. Everyone believes in God. Now, I've asked crowds to raise their hands. How many people is that a revelation for that everybody knows that God exists? You'd be surprised at the hands. I don't know how many times I read Romans 1 that everybody knows that God exists, and I went out and I tried to prove that God exists to them. What was I doing? I wasn't believing what God said in his word. Who needs proof that God exists? Nobody. Why not? They already know. Thanks for coming out. You know, we could end right there. We could end right there. Everybody knows that God exists. Go forth. But we won't. You see, people are not sent to hell for denying what they don't know, but for their sin against the God that they do know. Now, here's the question. Why do we send missionaries? Why do we send missionaries? If this man thinks that people who have never heard about God have an excuse, what does he do? Tells everyone about God. You know, if those people in that tribe in South America or whatever don't know that God exists, and if they have an excuse for not knowing, sending missionaries would be the worst thing we could do for them. We shouldn't send missionaries. We should build walls around them. We should prevent missionaries from getting to them. Because if they had an excuse, when we send missionaries, we're removing that excuse. Why do we send missionaries? We send missionaries because they're without excuse. We send missionaries to tell them about Christ. Because without Christ, they're going to hell for their sin against the God they know exists. Now, I know that from Scripture. I know that God says everybody knows that God exists. I know that from Scripture. I don't need anything to confirm that. But I want to play you a little bit of a sermon from a fellow named Paris Reedhead, who was a missionary in Africa. And this is what he said. And when I got to Africa, I discovered that they weren't poor, ignorant little heathen running around in the woods waiting for, looking for someone to tell them how to go to heaven. That they were monsters of iniquity. They were living in utter and total defiance of far more knowledge of God than I ever dreamed they had. They deserved hell because they utterly refused to walk in the light of their conscience and the light of the law written upon their heart, and the testimony of nature, and the truth they knew. This man went to unreached tribes in Africa to tell them about God, and they didn't want him. They wanted their sin. 
they knew about this God and they didn't want him. It's from a sermon called Ten Shackles and a Shirt. I urge you to check it out sometime. What about Grandma? Oh, I really wish I had your faith. It would make my life so much better. I really don't know that God exists. You know, if she doesn't know, telling the gospel to her would be the worst thing you could do. Because now you're removing her excuse. She does know. That's why we preach to them. So, if you remember nothing else about this talk, remember this. Everybody knows that God exists. It will change how you defend your faith. Think about it. You know anybody who becomes a Christian and says, well, what do you know? There is a God. I, haven't, I don't know of one unbeliever who's become a Christian and said, what do you know? There is a God. They're always professing what they've suppressed all along. It's a quote. Sometimes it's been attributed to Eric's father. I've heard it attributed to different people. The atheist can't find God for the same reason that a thief can't find a policeman. They're not looking. They're running from him. When someone tells you that they don't know that God exists, don't believe them. Don't believe them. You see, this might be as simple as challenging their claim. I was having dinner with a friend of mine not too long ago, and a good friend of mine, he says, Sai, the thing that I hate most about you is how certain you are that God exists. This is a friend of mine. What I hate about you is how certain you are that God exists. He says, how are you so certain that God exists? I didn't tell him about the complexity of the eye. I didn't tell him about rock layers. I didn't tell him about those things. Do you know what I said to him? Do you know how I'm so certain that God exists? The same way you are. But I'm following him, and you're not. You know what my friend said to me? Do you know what he said to me? He looked at his hands as if he had to go wash them. We'd just been to the restroom five minutes before. He got up from the table, walked away from the table. Do you know why? Because he was crying. This is a man that wanted me to present evidence that God exists, and I said, well, you know that God exists. Newport Beach. This fellow's name was Al. I was with a bunch of open-air evangelists on a bus doing some training, dropped us off, and I got away from the crowd because I don't really like crowds. This fellow came out to me and says, what's going on here? I said, oh, we're doing some... Well, what I said is there's a bunch of crazy Christians doing open-air preaching. And he says, oh, really? I said, yeah, I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a chuckle, and you know what he said to me? Two of my brothers committed suicide. I swore at God. I hated God. I shook my fist at him. No God would take my brothers. No God would, would do that. And you know, he had a bicycle there in that little basket in the front. He had a book on Hinduism. He just picked up a few, day, few days before at the dollar store. Underlined, dog-eared. He'd been reading it. He said, this Brahman, this oneness of being, I like this. This makes sense to me. I could get into this Hinduism. I didn't refute Hinduism for him. You know what I said to him? Tell me, is that the God you're mad at when your brothers committed suicide? You know what he said to me? Nothing. He was crying. Everybody knows that God exists. Sometimes it's just as simple as telling them that. A friend of mine, open air preacher, he heard me give this talk. Two days later, he was out doing some preaching, and a woman came up to him. How are you so sure that God exists? He said, man, the same way you are but I'm following them and you're not. She started crying. They had a great conversation afterwards. And you know what? Not everybody's going to say that. I've had people, I was in this Ivy League tour doing some open-air preaching as well. A fellow came up to me and says, I really don't know that God exists. I really don't know. I said, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says you do know. I really don't know. He says, well, the Bible says you do. No, sir, I don't. I said, well, then you're fine. Have a nice day. He didn't like that. He wanted me to try and convince him that the Bible was true. He wanted me to try and convince him that God exists. He wanted me to make him the judge. I wasn't going to do that. If that's all you do when somebody says, I really don't believe that God exists, say, yes, you do. That's what the Bible says. That's great. I'm happy with that. And you're not pleasing me. You have an audience of one, and it's not me, and it's not the unbeliever. It's the God that we all know exists, even the unbeliever. Because, you know, all Christians know that if the person you're talking to about to give evidence, if he were to drop dead before you gave him evidence, would he have an excuse when he stands before God? Does anybody believe that he would have an excuse when he stands before God? Of course not. And what are we giving him evidence for? When they already know, we have to expose that suppression of the truth. Do we believe in a probable God or a certain God? Eric read this earlier that we believe that nothing can separate us from the love of the Father. 
but we defend belief in a probable God or a certain God, well, we give them Pascal's wager. I'm just going to go through this quickly because you're running out of time, and I'm not a speaker, so I'm going to leave half my talk. But anyhow, um, we give them Pascal's wager. I could be wrong, but if I'm wrong, I die, rot in the ground, worms eat my body. If I'm right, I get to go to heaven. If you're wrong, you go to hell. If? Is that the God we talk about in church? Tears streaming down our face, nothing can separate me from the love of the Father. Then we go out into the world, I could be wrong. That's not the God we talk about in church. In the world, we're talking about something that's not God. And the problem is we're bringing that God into the church. We're bringing a Starbucks in our church because, you know, the kids need something else other than the message. In my breakout session, I was talking about a missionary from China who was doing some work in the United States, went back to China. And I said, what did you think about the church in America? He said, it's amazing what they can do without the Holy Spirit. An indictment of our church. You know, we're trying to take the place of the Holy Spirit. The heavens declare the, word of, uh, the, the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. What do we say when we go out into the world? Every building needs a builder. The Bible does not say the heavens declare the glory of a builder. The heavens declare the glory of God. God is not a builder. God's not a builder. God is the builder. They know it, and they're without excuse for denying it. I've told people this talk, and then I hear them talking to their friends. Every building needs a builder. Every building needs a builder. Are you kidding me? God's not a builder. You know the name of the builder, and you're going to stand before him sometime. You need to repent. Now, people, this will get in their heads, this apologetic, that everybody knows that God exists. And this is a little cute little video that some guys did there doing the Sunrise series. And I was telling them quite often, they're watching my debates, that God is not a builder, and this is what happened. Telling you, that is amazing. I have the craziest journey. That's one thing I've learned about doing these sunrises, man, is that God exists, and it's evident just because of that. Then every building needs a builder. God is not a builder. God is the builder. They know it, and they're without excuse for denying it. You saw that, right? You did see that. The white dude in the back seat? You saw that. There's a white dude in the back seat. Man, you need some coffee. Well, we barely made it. <sighs> These prices, I don't want to make it. Mercy. All right, man. Hand me the camera. You're pumping. I had enough events for today. I got it. It's him. It's him. It's him. There's, there's no one out there. What are you talking about, man? He was just there. Marcus. I think these sunrises are getting to me. Maybe it's the coffee. So I'm telling you, the dude was in my shop, man. I saw so, him. Yeah, I think it's in my room. God, what is this? Insane, man. Dude, that's him. That's the dude. Marcus, that's the dude right there. Dude, that's the. There's nobody. There's nobody right. out there. Look, Grab man. The camera. Look. No, look. We're man. going back around. I I'm, saw I'm dude. Telling you, I saw dude. There's nobody. The nope. There's Marcus, nobody this out there. This dude was there. in the back seat. I saw the brother. Look, man. There's nobody out there. Look. Dude, he was just there. I saw him, man. He was just there, and he had a sign. He was standing right here. I saw the dude. Right here, we passed right by. I saw the dude standing right. I'm not tripping. Robert, that's the definition of tripping. He was here. Get in the car. We're going home. Crazy dream, man. You'd never believe me if I told you. How do you know you're awake now? This stuff will mess with your mind. Okay, we're running out of time. I might go a little long. I don't care. I'll just cut into Eric's time. There's only two worldviews. There's God and there's not God. I address all not God worldviews the same way. Professing them wise. What does it say about those who deny God? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now, what does it say in Psalm 14? One, the brilliant mathematician has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, oh, wait a minute. No, that's not right. The scholarly scientist who said in his heart, there is no God. Oh, that's not right either. It's the amazing atheist who says there is no... Psalm 14.1. It's the fool that said in his heart there is no God. It's the fool. Fool is somebody who's willfully ignorant. I was going to tell you a story about that. I don't have enough time. Say, too bad God never gave us any direction as how to answer the fool. Too bad, you know, it's such an important thing. Too bad he never told us how to answer. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. What's the fool's folly? The fool's folly is that there is no God. Answer him not according to that folly, lest you be like him. What do we do? 
let's pretend there's no God. We'll look at the evidence and we'll see whose worldview makes most sense. Doing exactly what the Bible tells us not to do. Exactly what the Bible tells us not to do. Now, the God that we believe in, Romans eleven thirty six, from him, for of him, through him, and to him are all things. God is not the conclusion to the argument. He's the necessary starting point. See, God is not a God that you can reason to. He's the God that you, can re- that you cannot reason, that you can't reason without. God is the foundation of reasoning. What do all things include? Logic, knowledge, morality, words. Sorry I'm going through this, but I see that the clock is running out here. When an unbeliever says that there is no God, we should be even more perplexed as if they had just said there are no words. The Bible calls these people fools. If somebody came up to you and said there are no words, you'd think he was a fool. They say there is no God. Oh, really? Well, let me give you some evidence for that. Excuse me? All things include words, logic, everything. When a person asks you for evidence of God, and this is one thing I said, ask them if they'd worship him if you could prove that he existed. What if they said yes? What if the person said, yeah, I'd worship him? You know what I say to you? You know what I say to them? You probably would, because it wouldn't be the God of the Bible. Any God that needs me to give evidence for is not God. It's an idol of your own making. When we cease to worship God, we do not worship nothing. We worship anything. What happens when you deny God? Well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, this is a little illustration that I give to people, the FedEx logo. Now, how many people have ever seen the arrow in the FedEx logo? Just a handful. I can't look at that logo now without seeing the arrow. Hopefully, when you read your Bible, you cannot look at your Bible anymore now without seeing this, that everybody knows that God exists. It will change the way you defend your faith. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Unless you start with God, you can't know anything. Eric gave an illustration as to why that's the case, but so I'll just go through this quickly. In order to know anything, you'd have to know everything. Who knows everything? God. So in order to know anything, you would have to be God or have revelation from God. The proof that God exists is that without him, you couldn't prove or know anything. I just gave it away on my website, but that's what the proof is. How do I know that the Bible is true? How do I know that the Bible is true? People ask me that question all the time. How do I know the Bible is true? As a Christian, I could say by reading it. The Holy Spirit has opened my heart. He's given me a heart of flesh, taken out my heart of stone. You know when an unbeliever asks me how I know the Bible is true? I don't go to paper fragment P66 and say, this shows me that the Bible is true. You know what I say to an unbeliever when he says, how, how do you know the Bible is true? I say, because if it wasn't, you couldn't make sense of your question. When he says, how do I know the Bible is true? He's assuming there's, a, there's such a thing as truth. You cannot make sense of truth without God. Just the question assumes that God exists. I'm really sorry I've got to fly through these things. Do unbelievers know anything? Sure. How can an unbeliever know anything? I know the guy that took out my appendix that he knew things. How do I know that he knew things? Because he knows that God exists. If he's not a believer, the reason he can know things is not because his worldview is true, but because mine is true. Sorry, I've got to go through these things real quick. For example, what does somebody say, you believe, in Noah's, uh, in, you believe that uh, Jonah was swallowed by a, a big fish? And what do people say? Well, there's this whale shark off the coast of Madagascar, you know, that could hold a man. And if he was in the first section of the stomach, well, you know, he could probably live in there three days. It's not our job to prove miracles. It's not our job to prove miracles. If they deny that God exists, those things are crazy. Those things are crazy. That, you know, a donkey talked, a man who was dead for three days. But the thing is, if you deny that God exists, you can't make sense of truth. You can't make sense of knowledge. You can't make sense of anything. I had a a heckler one day. He said, you believe in a crazy book. You believe in a fairy tale. I said, look, if you deny that God exists, of course it doesn't make sense. But if you profess the creator of the universe who breathed this world into existence, a, a talking donkey is nothing. You need to repent. And that's what we get... We're trying to give unbelievers evidence so that they'll come to know the truth and repent. We try to give them evidence so that they'll come to know the truth and repent. And what does the Bible say? They need to repent so they can know the truth. We've got it exactly upside down. We're trying to give them truth so that they repent when they have to repent for denying that God that they know exists so they can know the truth. Are you guys going to cut me off soon? Just give me a minute, sorry. Now, when Paul was before Agrippa, he did not try and prove the resurrection to them. He did not try and prove the resurrection to Agrippa. He said, why do you find it incredible that God should raise the dead? Why do you find that incredible? 
And what do we do? Prove the resurrection. And we give them evidence for it. Evidence is great for Christians. It's fantastic for Christians. But the problem is we're making that person the judge. So I'm just going to go right to the end. My question to you, sir, is how do you know that your reasoning is valid? Reasoning about what? About anything. Your ability to reason. I don't know that it's valid okay, until I right. test it. Well, the thing is, you test your, your reasoning using your reasoning. And that's viciously circular. Yes, we're, we're talking in a circle here now. That's right. You're using your re reason. Two equals two equals two equals two equals two. We can do that forever. But you're using your reasoning to validate your reasoning. Don't you see a problem with that? No, I don't see any problem with that. Your okay. solution is revelation. That's right. right. Yeah. So yeah. I could say, if I said God exists because God exists, you would have a problem with that. I have a problem with that because That's I don't right. see any evidence. I know, but the that. thing is, what is the evidence that your reasoning is valid? <laughs> We're talking in circles now. That's right. Th this yeah. is very juvenile, and I don't get involved in juvenile arguments. See, these are brilliant people. James Randi, brilliant guy. I'm just going to show a few more of these, and then I'll get off. Sorry about that for going on. I, th I think the two arguments that I will put back to you, Sai, are miracles and intercessionary prayer. There you have two instances where something should happen, and there is a probability that something might happen, but that's as far as you go. There is no certainty. Are you certain about that? <laughs> that's what you'll see on my debates. I'm just going to whip through here. A lot of people will get mad at me. You know what I say? If you go to a bricklayer and you say that last brick you put in is crooked, he's not going to be mad at you. You tell him the first row is crooked, there's going to be a fight. And that's what we're doing with this worldview. We're telling them that the first row is crooked. I wish I could play for you, these for you sometime. You want to see that one? Oh, sorry. You're, are you going to give me some of your time? This is a fellow named... The captain, this fellow, he would be out on the streets of L.A., and he would argue with people for quite a while, for hours at a time. So Chad Williams, Navy SEAL, brought me to this guy and says, Sai, I want you to talk to this guy, so we'll see if we can get it. Are you, are you interested in talking or? I'm right here. Okay. What do you know, and how do you know it? What do I know, and how, and how, how do I know it? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You don't know anything? Nothing. Do you know that you don't know anything? Not, uh, no. I don't know that I do not know nothing. So you don't know anything? Yes. Okay. And that's what I'm saying, that if you deny the God of Scripture, you can't know anything. And you agree with so. that. I deny your God, yes, but right. I have the right to do that, don't I? Well, how do you know you have that right? Wait, are you saying I don't in this free country? No, I'm saying that you said you can't know anything, and you're telling me you're making a knowledge claim. Good, that's what I have. Yeah, but you don't know anything, and you make a knowledge claim. That's, that's, that's self-refuting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have a problem with that? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. See, that's the inconsistency that happens when you die, Sir, deny the God of Scripture. your God is self-refuting. How do you know that? Because he invented you. You just said that you don't know anything. Hey, guys, how you doing? Yes, yeah, Captain, I expected more out of you. You see what I did there? You see what I did there? The Bible says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. But you know what? Too bad God didn't tell us how we're supposed to answer the fool. I came up with that myself. You know what I did? To deny truth, to deny knowledge is conceited. I answered him according to his, I answered him according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Why didn't God tell us to do that? I mean, the Bible says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like unto him. Wait a minute. God did tell us that. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. But that must have been somewhere else in Scripture. I mean, he couldn't have put it real close together. I mean, we could have missed that easily. That was in Proverbs 26.4. The, the other one must have been in Habakkuk or Nehemiah or something like that. <laughs> Folks, we're doing it wrong. Answer them according to his folly. Don't let them steal your authority. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go out and make disciples. Don't give up your authority. And uh, I'm sorry I timed this wrong, that I had to scream through it. I apologize for that, Eric. But um, when somebody denies that God exists, know that they know, and it'll change how you defend your faith. Thanks a lot.